Good afternoon to you, Mark Sutter with HurricaneTrack.com, here with your off-season edition of the Hurricane Outlook and Discussion for Monday, the 19th of March, 2018. Taking a look at the SOI, I just want to look at the graph real quick. Overall, the 90-day trend, pretty flat, with a little bit of a rise right here towards the end, which is where we are now. And, you know, so really no signs of an El Nino pattern setting up overall. We had a pretty big dip in the 30-day average, and then it has climbed pretty significantly as well, now sitting at positive 7 or so. And that's just not sustained negative, obviously. You can clearly see that, especially in the 90-day data going right through here, very flat. And then just a little bit of an uptick here in the recent uh, couple of weeks or so. And that's not going to promote an El Nino. It's just not there. Even the subsurface chart here, they finally fixed this. Remember, it was kind of weird the other day. It had that large area of blue right up the middle. Uh, I think they have fixed it. Here is your cold pool remaining in the eastern Pacific and then a very large area of warmth. Uh, this downwelling Kelvin wave, as it is called. You know, So as this comes across and sort of bleeds out, and mixes in with all of this, there's really nothing else coming from behind. And that's important here. We don't see the setup promoting sustained warmth in the tropical Pacific, and I still don't think there's much of a chance of an El Nino taking shape, certainly not in time to disrupt the Atlantic hurricane season to any degree, and at best, I think, would be sort of a warm neutral where the sea surface temperatures uh, departures are, you know, basically just slightly warmer than zero, which is neutral. Uh, and this, I think, clearly indicates that. We're not seeing the mechanisms in place. They're just not there. And, you know, we're almost to April, and when we look at past El Nino's like the one in 2015, that was a very substantial one. All the major players were already in motion, and we're not seeing that this year. And there's been some talk on Twitter and elsewhere that you know the European model, very aggressive again, with some of its ensemble members in El Nino, whereas the CFS V2 climate model um, holding on to cold neutral or even La Nina, so that battle going on once again. And remember how poorly overall the global models handled the El Nino, the dynamical models, for last year. So let's just move on, shall we? So the Atlantic Basin... The NOAA NESDA sea surface temperature chart did not update today for whatever reason. So we'll look at the Reynolds uh, methodology here from the National Hurricane Center site. And this is valid for the last week ending around the 17th. And overall, the main development region right about where it should be. A few pockets of slightly cooler than normal. The North Atlantic up here, the subtropics, way up in the North Atlantic, uh, running quite a bit above the long-term average. Again, this is something we'll just keep watching over time, see how this progresses, and go from there. Uh, no major surprises either way. Not very cold overall, not very warm overall. So in terms of seasonal forecasting, I think it would be easy to prognosticate that Phil Klotzbach at Colorado State University um, and any others that are going to be putting out seasonal forecasts in April which is, you know, kind of hard to do uh, in terms of trying to get it right. An average season, you know, wouldn't surprise me at all, maybe slightly above. That would be my thinking for now, because there's no signs to the contrary leaning in one way or one direction or the other for hyperactivity or below normal activity. This looks like a regular season, which can be very busy. So it only takes one, as they say, anyway. Gulf of Mexico continues to warm, of course, since we're into March. Uh, it's going to do that. But I like to look at the different patterns of what's going on here. There's the loop current coming in. Fairly warm over here in the southwest bay of, or southeast bay of Campeche. Uh, for spring breakers, still enjoying the beaches. Shelf water, still, still fairly cold. Uh, they ought to do spring break later, like the latter part of April into May. But you know, who am I to decide that, right? That's just a suggestion. East Coast area, uh, again, a pretty sharp temperature gradient here between the west wall of the Gulf Stream and the colder uh, shelf water that comes down uh, along the East Coast. And again, you know, everything's warming up gradually, no major surprises. 
And that's good, because nothing to really throw off anything. You don't want, you know, anomalies are interesting to track, but if anything is just wildly askew, it tends to throw a monkey wrench into the overall pattern, and it makes things a lot harder to deal with. And for the most part, they've been hard to deal with because of this very strong blocking high over Greenland, and uh, that's resulted in cold air getting drained down into the northeast United States. This is a different perspective. There's the North Pole right there. All right, so we're looking down on the Earth on this particular map from top, top down. All right. So then over here, you have this vast expanse over here in Russia. Very, very cold as well over there as the uh, same kind of mechanism in place where high pressure dominating the pattern, draining the cold air down into Russia. They call it the beast from the east. And the highest precipitation has been along the border of where that has been. You know, all of Russia up here frozen with snow and ice, but... It's been fairly wet as well where that cold air has met the warm air coming out of the subtropical continent here. And that border region been fairly wet overall and snowy in some places. But it's just interesting how these departures from normal in the atmosphere, very strong high pressure sitting over Greenland, this Greenland block as we call it, does have ramifications downstream. Now I'm not as versed on the upper patterns, the wave patterns of the atmosphere in terms of the Asian and the Russian uh, subcontinent region of how this all works. But it's interesting to note that looking at the overall pattern and how it's been kind of a wild march for the northeast United States has also led to a very cold period for the last several weeks in parts of Asia and Russia specifically. Interesting. Or maybe not. I thought it was. All right, so looking at lower 48 weather... Now that we're leaving uh, Russian weather behind, busy day going to shape up here in parts of the deep south. Uh, moderate risk of severe weather. We'll take a closer look at that in a moment in this region. So keep your NOAA weather radios, your phones, your EAS activated devices, whatever. You want to be aware of what's going on because we're getting into that season where you get this warm, moist flow coming out of the Gulf, meeting this storm system over here, trailing cold front and all kinds of mayhem can ensue. And in fact, we do have this moderate risk if we look at the outlook specifically for today. If this will work for me. Come on. I don't want a discussion. Oh, here we go. i got to scroll down, I think. Why is this not cooperating like I want it to? Let's look at the outlook. There we go. So today, moderate risk in northern Alabama, extreme southern central Tennessee. You know, basically anything inside of this enhanced area, this orange you know, you can have some real problems there, so please pay attention, especially as the night unfolds. I saw James Spann uh, from Birmingham talking about people wanting specific time frames of when severe weather could occur, and that's not possible to detect, at least in this particular situation. And it's pretty much from now until midnight, so please keep aware. If you know people in that area, give them a heads up. We're all busy, 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 and you don't want to miss out. And, hey, where'd that severe thunderstorm with baseball-sized hail come from? Can't get caught by surprise with all the information that's at our fingertips anymore, all right? So please pay attention. So that's today. Let's see, how do I get to day two? There it is. So day two, the focus shifts to my neck of the woods, uh, eastern parts of the Carolinas down here, and then parts of central Florida, so the big tourist areas, even from Tampa up through Orlando, Universal, Walt Disney World, you all, pay attention, okay? Be careful. Be on the lookout. It's tornado season, getting into it. We don't want any problems of people not being aware. Nothing aggravates me more than people saying they didn't know. That just seems to be impossible. I got bad news for you folks along the East Coast, Mid-Atlantic, Northeast, etc. Yes, another Nor'easter. They're going to call this one the Four-Easter. Uh, cute. There you go. You want a name for it? There you go, the Four-Easter. Kind of a complicated, messy setup here over the next 48 hours as the system moves off the mid-Atlantic heavy rain up here through parts of Virginia, and then ice and snow and just yucky conditions, wet snow at that. We're getting later in the nor'easter season, so the snow is going to be less and less powdery, much more slushy and sticking on trees. There is an easterly wind component blowing right into the coast here, 
So maybe some tidal issues because we are near an astronomically high tide. All right, so pay attention to that along the Jersey coast, all the way up through portions of southeast Massachusetts. And this one goes on out, thank goodness. And then we reload from more storm systems coming in from the west and working their way south because this block is sitting up here. And so nothing can just go across. The pattern is not able to be progressive, you know, like the insurance company, right? They can't, these storms just can't scoot on by because of this high pressure area sitting right here. The Greenland block, a real pain in the butt. So if you want to blame something, blame that. Uh, so that's five days out. The next storm system comes in through day seven. Yep, you know, eventually the pattern will flip and we'll get into some true spring and some different types of weather. This is just ridiculous. Uh, speaking of severe weather, I will be traveling, as I hinted to earlier, later this week to Starkville, Mississippi, where I will be a part of the Southeast Severe Storm Symposium, and uh, that's this weekend, 24th and 25th. I'm a keynote speaker, and I'm uh, very honored to be a part of this. I'm going to be talking about last year's hurricane season, and I will be joined by, I mean, again, what an honor it is, but man, to be able to sit in the audience and hear Brian Norcross, Rick Smith, Carl Parker, and then all of the other presenters, there'll be National Weather Service offices, universities represented there. Great lineup of speakers Saturday and Sunday. If you're going, I can't wait to see you there. It's going to be an awesome time and a chance to learn and promote discovery and innovation and you know forging forward into the world of meteorology from these students. Uh, not only from Mississippi State, but from elsewhere, converging in Stark Vegas, as they call it. i got to ask them why they say that, why it's called Stark Vegas as a nickname. Uh, it's a nice area. In fact, it's grown a lot since I first visited there many, many years ago when I thought about attending for Mississippi State Meteorology, but instead I went to UNC Wilmington for geography, uh, and it's really grown a lot. So if you haven't been there, check it out. You know, if you're going to this, it's a nice area. You come right out of, like, open, wooded countryside, boom, and you're in Starkville. It's pretty amazing. It's an oasis, and maybe that's why they call it Stark Vegas. It's like an oasis, not in the desert, but it's like pine forest, and anyway, I'm rambling. The next conference after that is in a totally different area, South Padre Island, Texas. Also a beautiful area, the Barrier Island down there. Um, spring, spring break has it probably jammed up with youngsters right now they will clear out good for the economy not so good for conference time at least it'll be over by then and uh, we will convene us science nerds and so forth to have our conference i'm looking forward to this as well again i've talked about it uh, several times but i just want to remind you you can still register at hurricanecenterlive.com a phenomenal lineup of people and you know i'm gonna say it one more time this one is so unique because of the closeness of it, the, the intimacy of being able to mingle and talk with these presenters, myself included, is unlike the very large conferences where you have two, three, four thousand people in a big city where everybody goes and scatters. Not the case down in South Padre Island. Uh, you're kind of held captive, but it's, it's beautiful. It's awesome. And it's, what do you mean held captive? It's like a captive audience. Because you don't just leave and dissipate over, you know, Orlando or Atlanta or D.C. or Houston or whatever. You know what I mean? You're down there and you're in that area. It's great. So if you haven't already signed up, and if you can and you can make the trip, do so. It'll be worth your while, I promise. All right, that's it for me for today and for the rest of the week. Again, be weather aware in the areas where the severe weather is a brewing, And uh, we want you back to watch future updates, right? I will have more next week after I get back from Stark Vegas, Starkville, Mississippi, in the symposium. Have a great rest of your week ahead. I'm Mark Suttoth, HurricaneTrack.com. As always, thank you for watching. We'll talk again next week.